Oh, thank you. <laughs> Wait until afterwards and see if you still feel the same way. Um, well, that's when I ask questions. Uh, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Help. Yeah, like, let's turn them down. Like, can we just turn the, 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 the one lady? <laughs> I don't okay. think we have that fancy of a room. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't want them all the way off. I mean, that could be... Uh, what do you think? Can you see it without them being on? Awesome? Okay. This is a shameless plug for the class I'm teaching next semester. In case anybody really wants to have political science class. Sorry, I only had three, but oh, they can share. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, the topic is Jefferson's Agrarian Democracy. And I um, am not an American government specialist. So um, I, this is not my area of expertise, so to speak. But I thought it was an interesting topic. I'm a political theorist, so it sort of is, but I'm just saying in, as we specialize, I didn't go to grad school and you know study this stuff. However, I feel competent in understanding Jefferson because he's not a political philosopher and his thought is derivative of other people's thoughts. So I sort of relate to his ideas through other people that he would have read. So that's going to come out a little bit in this. So go on. We know Jefferson uh, as the author of the Declaration of Independence, and actually this is the most famous phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those ideas came directly from a political philosopher from England named John Locke, and in fact that's pretty much a paraphrase of what Locke says. So go on. <laughs> um, of course, he was the third president of the United States, so we know him in, in that capacity. But what we don't know as much about is that he was sort of a farmer, sort of into agriculture. So, okay. so I visited his home, Monticello in Virginia, years ago. Um, I used to work in Virginia for like one year. and. While I was there, I did some sightseeing, and this is one of the places I went to. And it's a beautiful kind of plantation type of home. Uh, he was from money, and he w inherited this land. It was part of his inheritance. And inside the home, you can see that, I mean, they take you through this tour, and they show you that, you know, Jefferson tinkered with everything, and he created all these things in his house. Um, to and make his servant's life more comfortable and easy and so on and so forth. So he experimented with technology, okay. And, but he also experimented with um, agriculture, and I'm gonna turn this off for a bit because the pictures are important. So this is Monticello, the mansion, and then you can see it's, it's surrounded by a lot of woods, but over here there's quite an extensive garden. There are also gardens up closer to the house that you can't see very well here, but um, Jefferson had a fairly extensive garden. Go ahead. All right, so um, I wanted you to just play a little snippet of this one. Click on this one if you would, um, because it's somebody talking about the vegetable garden. It'll come up. It'll come up more and less. There we go. We can turn up. So, yeah. And we might want to stop the play on that because it'll probably keep going, but we'll see. Um, Sorry. No, uh, it's okay. It's, yeah, those explore ones. Yep, it's. Thank you. Whoa. Cancel. Cancel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, go on to the next one. He had vineyards too, but I won't regale you with all of that. But he, he experimented with growing different types of grapes and making wine as well. And the thing to know about Jefferson as a gardener was that he, he, he used his garden as kind of a laboratory, so he wasn't too interested in production as in, you know, making enough to sell or anything like that. But he wanted to know what grew where and just you know, study these plants. Um, so he grew 330 vegetable varieties and 170 fruit varieties, different kinds of fruits, and it was more or less a botanical garden and a laboratory for him because he just loved to study 
and experiment. If something didn't work, he made a note of that. He had all these journals that these people who work on that farm now actually go back to frequently to try to figure out exactly how it's done. Because the people who are doing this, that, that work there, they're trying to basically conduct this garden like he did, like he and his servants did. Okay. All right, he was a naturalist then, uh, more than he was a gardener or a farmer. Naturalist is just somebody who's interested in nature, wants to study it, you know, even did little sketches and things like that. Okay? Um, he was a failed farmer and he admitted it and after a while he handed this over to uh, more or less a farm manager who got more out of it. But his priorities were knowledge and beauty and so a lot of his garden was flowers and just, you know, it was arranged beautifully. Um, and this is, you got a lot of enjoyment out of it, okay. All right, so about Jefferson, a little bit more background is necessary because in order to understand why he thought of agriculture the way he did, you have to understand he was an Enlightenment figure. He came from a period of time we call the Enlightenment uh, during the, ninth, or the 18th century uh, in Europe. The Enlightenment was full of boom. It led to the French Revolution shortly after the American Revolution. Um, and the Enlightenment is characterized by this type of person. Um, they believe that, you know, the, the most important thing in life was the constant quest for knowledge. The human knowledge, the more it expanded, the more, the better our lives would be. Um, and part of that was a questioning of orthodox religion, and in some cases an alter the alternative of atheism. Some of the uh, Enlightenment thinkers were atheists. Jefferson was maybe what you would call a deist, which is somebody who believes in a first creator, a first mover, a creator of, of things, but a type of God that stepped back and, and wasn't a personal God so much. And so he actually um, wrote, or I should say edited, he annotated or abridged or something like that, the Bible. And this is actually Jefferson's Bible in the original, and you can see that what he did was he literally cut, this is the artifact, this is the Bible, he cut out sections and it was the sections that he did not believe, okay? And all, it had to do anything miraculous, anything sort of mystical he took out and he kept in um, Jesus' sayings of a sort of what he considered a philosophical nature, you know, good rules to live by and things like that because he was a firm believer in the idea of being a good person, a moral person, and he did believe in God, but he didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ or in any of these miraculous things, okay? So we now have Jefferson's Bible in our libraries. Um, it's not cut up. It's all the stuff that he left in, okay? Um, so Enlightenment figures generally, they, they maybe went, didn't go that far, but they questioned traditional religious beliefs. Um, and they placed a very high uh, priority on human reason and they thought that the problem with previous eras was that people had not thought enough systematically and kind of scientifically about how to run their lives, how to run government, how to run food and everything else, you know, and that if they just applied more reason, uh, they would uh, uh, move forward. We wouldn't have some of the problems with starvation or political turmoil that we had, okay? And a key aspect of that was making sure that more people became educated. So he was a great advocate of the expansion of education. This is a quote from Jefferson to a friend, Dupont de Moor. Uh, although, he says, although I do not, with some enthusiasts, believe that the human condition will ever advance to such a state of perfection, as that there shall be no longer pain or vice in the world, yet I believe it is susceptible of much improvement, and most of all in matters of government and religion, and that diffusion of knowledge amongst the people is to be the instrument by which it is to be effected. So a great statement about the power of education and his optimism for how that could change people's lives. All right, one intellectual influence I'm gonna talk about Jean-Jacques Rousseau, because Rousseau is all about nature, all about, he, he got the movement started in France for the natural garden versus the you know, ornate garden with the sculptured hedges and all that stuff. Rousseau was a thinker who believed that 
human beings naturally were fairly good and if you went back far enough into their natural state and you actually imagined what people were like in primitive times, almost as all, before Darwin, but he almost imagined human beings being kind of like the primates, roaming around, pretty independent uh, of everybody else, coming together for one thing only, which was procreation, and then going on their way. And then at a certain point, they, would, they formed small communities, and this was still pretty nice, and they lived communally, and they took care of themselves. And so he harked back to this natural time of peace and you know, primitive, the sort of primitive hunter-gatherer way of life as superior to modern civilization. And so he thought that if we could put people in the proper environment that de-emphasized materialism and mechanization and those kind of things, that we could bring people back closer to their natural state, and that would be a state in which they were much better, much, much more good. Um, so, and of course, democracy was a part of Rousseau's vision um, so, go ahead. All right. So, up against this romantic and ideal and somewhat patrician vision, patrician meaning sort of aristocratic, of Thomas Jefferson, because he came from a wealthy family, he was a sort of blue blood Virginian, okay? Um, we got Alexander Hamilton. Go back. You've got to click on that link. you know there's a musical on to like pass that one um, is because the difference between Jefferson and Hamilton is is more than just the difference in philosophy it's a difference in background Alexander Hamilton literally came he as it says the sun maybe horror is a little bit too strong but um, no no like breeding or background okay he's a self-made man totally you know based upon his his intelligence, right? He didn't inherit anything. And, you know, everything that he got, he worked hard for. And I think that he learned the lesson that, you know, that that's how, that's the virtuous way to succeed, okay? Whereas Jefferson inherited this land. He was kind of a, you know, an American aristocratic figure. He had a plantation. And um, they, they came from very different backgrounds. Those backgrounds shaped the way they think. And Hamilton's way of thinking is close to what we still idolize in this country. We adopted Hamilton's way of thinking, you know. It, you work hard, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you can make yourself, it doesn't matter what, what your background, where you came from. Whereas Jefferson, coming from the, you know, he had some money, he had, he didn't have to worry about survival, he had a certain reputation before he came into, uh, in, in, onto the political scene. He went to a really good school. You know, he, he was born and bred to lead, so to speak. Um, those two backgrounds give you two very different perspectives on life. And America, of course, was going to reject the aristocratic, patrician, you know, uh, sort of blue blood way of thinking in favor of Hamilton. And in the early founding period, those two visions were in competition with each other seriously in competition with each other. Hamilton wanted something closer to a monarchy. You know, he wanted the president to be strong. He wanted the U.S. government to be centralized and powerful. Jefferson wanted a much more, uh, I guess, the, for the power to be diffused uh, and for, the, for America to not be so strong in the world, but to be more strong in itself, to be more, I guess you might say, independent. Hamilton was a Federalist. Jefferson became a, a Democratic Republican because after a while he wanted to oppose Federalism. Federalism was, was Hamilton's way of thinking, you know, make a strong national government, weaken the states, okay? Hamilton felt that federal government should be strong because otherwise the country would be vulnerable. It would be vulnerable to attack you know, without that unification. Also, with states having a lot of power, there'd be so many differences, and even their money could be different. We might not have a national coin. Uh, you know, they'd have trade barriers, maybe. Uh, they wouldn't be able to trade effectively. So with all these divisions, the American economy couldn't spring up. So Jefferson 
uh, believed in decentralization, bringing power down to a local level, states and, and even beyond that to lower levels. Hamilton for the strong national government. And Hamilton just characteristically was horrified by the French Revolution where they killed the king and queen and they pretended to be democratic for a while, whereas Jefferson thought this was a really exciting event because it furthered the power of the people. Okay? Hamilton was very skeptical of the power of the people. Okay? All right, so he, Hamilton was our first Treasury Secretary. Um, and he instituted our national bank. Um, this is from U.S. history. He says, the American economy had traditionally rested upon large-scale agricultural exports to pay for the imports of British manufactured goods. Hamilton rightly thought that this dependence on expensive foreign goods kept the American economy at a limited level, especially when compared to the rapid growth of early industrialization in Great Britain. So, in other words, his opinion was that if we kept going with mainly being an agricultural country, we'd always be limited in our power, we might be unable to compete with Great Britain, we'd always be their satellite. His aggressive support for manufacturing banks and strong public credit all became central aspects of the modern capitalist economy that would develop in the United States in the century after his death. Nevertheless, policies were deeply controversial in their day. So that, hence, that's probably why we have a musical about Hamilton and not about Jefferson. Okay, go ahead. Um, so here's from Hamilton himself explaining his preference for commercial as opposed to an ag agricultural economy. He says, it has been maintained by Jefferson, I'm inferring, that agriculture is not only the most productive, but the only productive species of industry. The reality of the suggestion in either respect has, however, not been verified by any accurate detail of facts and calculations, and the general arguments were introduced to prove it are rather subtle and paradoxical rather than solid and convincing. So these two men, Hamilton and Jefferson, they argued with each other about this. Go ahead. All right. So th what we see in this uh, division between the two is a div difference in values, pure and simple, really, um, between aristocratic uh, values versus bourge what we call bourgeois virtues. Okay? Um, Jefferson, being more of an aristocrat, did not like this idea that uh, uh, I don't, he wouldn't be anti-capitalist exactly because the capitalist system hadn't quite developed yet, but but the idea that manufacturing, you know, making money from investments and things like that was superior to working on the land. John Maynard Keynes says of this type of economy, the greatest merit of the capitalist system is that it succeeds in using the nastiest motives of nasty people for the ultimate benefit of society. And that's kind of in a nutshell what Jefferson was suspicious of about the what was to become the capitalist economy, that it tended to promote vice because it relied on self-interest. In fact, it runs on selfishness. And so he was kind of suspicious that, that, that the economic system would spill over in our mentality to a lot of other areas of our life and that we would look more selfishly upon just about every aspect of life. So, you know, I, I relate this to uh, writings by Martin Diamond and Leo Strauss. Those are people you don't know, probably, but, um, but Diamond wrote about the difference between so-called high-toned virtues and low-toned so-called bourgeois virtues, which are business virtues, basically. You know? High-toned virtues are things that ask you to extend yourself beyond yourself, beyond your own self-interest. Honor, duty, charity, and faith would be examples of that. You are, in, when you practice these things, they actually can hurt. You are doing what you have to do, not necessarily what's in your self-interest. When, when a soldier in our military drops onto an IED or whatever, whatever they're called, the impro improvised explosive device, He's not thinking of his self-interest. That's a matter of duty, right? Um, versus the bourgeois virtues, some of these are agreeableness, which means you know being able to get along with other people because you can't do business without getting along with other people. Rational self-interest being good because you uh, rational self-interest means that you extend beyond you know you just your immediate reaction to being nice to people and cooperating with people 
uh, because it makes sense for your bottom line. Uh, frugality, of course, is a virtue. To, uh, ben Franklin liked that virtue. He didn't practice it. Temperance, also, which means moderation, not indulging in too much alcohol or sex or things like that. So all of that is good for the economy. Um, but deeper still, underlying this between Jefferson and Hamilton and the ways of thinking is a, con a, a uh, conflict between the contemplative and the active life. Which one is more important? Because Jefferson thought that the agricultural way of life with its slower pace and with, it, with more community uh, encouraged the contemplative life, meaning you had more time to think and develop your internal self, whereas the commercial way of life, you're so much about outward activities and it, it draws you out to the point where you don't have the time to think about who you are, what you want to do with your life, what life is about. Jefferson kind of sided with uh, Socrates, you know, on this. He said the unexamined life is not worth living and the agricultural or more rural way of life gives you more of a chance to examine yourself. But now we live in a very high-paced society even compared to this time. We're constantly drawn into our phones and our, you know, what, you know, our consumerism and everything. It leaves us very little time to think about who we are inside and what we really value, okay? So this was Jefferson's concern, okay? All right, so that gets us to what you probably really want to know about, which is what Jefferson really thought about agriculture, why it was, you know, getting into more depth as to why it was that this way of life was superior um, and why he pushed it and tried to resist the commercialization of America. Um, Jefferson thought that American manufacturing should be limited to only what could support farming. So he was, he was saying, you know what, we, can, we, have, we should have some of these people, but they should only be making things like plows and, you know, whatever it is that supports agriculture. So he said, while we have land to labor, let us never wish to see our citizens kept at a workbench or twirling at a distaff, which was be, this would be like spinning and weaving. Carpenters, masons, and smiths are wanted in husbandry, and that's highlighted because that means farming and a lot of people aren't familiar with that term, but you've probably heard of animal husbandry, right? Well, it more generally applies to the cultivation of, of the world, of the, of the earth. But for the general op operation of manufacturers, let our workshops remain in Europe. So let them do that. They can send their machinery over to us. We will continue to farm, okay? And we'll remain virtuous and free, he thought, as long as our lands remain agricultural, which is partly why he wanted to, the Louisiana Purchase, because you buy all this more land, you've got, the, you know, much more room to expand, people can continue to cultivate it, and it can, people can expand the country in this way. Okay. All right, so uh, this is from Notes on the State of Virginia. Most of what I could find in the way of, of, of this topic came from his Notes on the State of Virginia. He says, it is the mark set on those who not looking up to heaven to their own soil and industry as does the husbandman for their subsistence depend for it on the casualties and caprice of customers. Dependence begets subservience and venality, which is kind of a greediness, suffocates the germ of virtue and prepares fit tools for the designs of ambition. Okay, we have to kind of unpack that a little bit, okay? Um, the the industry the, the people who are involved in industry he says don't look upward and they instead are dependent upon buying and selling right so we think of this and I think Hamilton thought of this the commercial economy as a great freeing up you know that would lead to more liberty because people wouldn't have to be toiling away on a farm um, and they could get more of what they want and have and raise their standard of living. But what Jefferson is saying is that this makes you uh, a, a sort of dependent upon the vagaries of the market. So if, if there's a demand for what you make, then great, you're good for now. But you're going to have to worry about the fact that someday you might have more competition or the demand may lower and you could be poor. Meanwhile, you don't have any ability to pay to feed yourself because you're not on a farm where you can actually feed yourself, 
Okay, so you've lost your ability of to have that independence that comes from actually owning land and farming land. Independence in the most basic sense, meaning I can feed myself and my family. And you've traded it for, if I have a job, I might be able to feed myself and my family. So is this a great leap forward in, in uh, Jefferson's point of view? No. So that's why he says dependence begets subservience because now you're the servant. Most people are the servant in a way of the owner of the business that they work for and greed because it tends to make people think more about just their bottom line. If you live on a farm, you don't need a lot of money because you can, at least to a certain extent, you can take care of yourself without it, okay? as long as the, as long as things work right, right weather-wise, right? you do have to worry about that. Okay. All right, and that makes people bit tools for the adopt designs of ambition. In other words, it makes them feel less independent because they are less independent, which means they're more susceptible to politicians who will tell them, oh, I'll make your, live, your, your way of life better with my policies vote for me. And it makes people less likely to think independently. Okay. All right, to a in a letter to John Jay, he said, I consider the class of artificers, which are those who manufacture, as panderers of vice and the instruments by which the liberties of a country are generally overthrown. So you can see some passion there, right? Panderers of vice. Well, I mean, it means that they pander to your desires, right? So. I mean, he, was, he had some foresight there because now we buy all sorts of stuff we don't need at all, right? That actually kind of make us maybe a little bit worse rather than better, but even back then for people who had money, that was the case. So they'll sell you anything that you'll buy, in other words, right? And that may or may not be good for you, okay? Um, so why is, a commercial, is commerce corrosive and agriculture beneficial to independence in particular? Um, he thought that manufacturing put too much power in the hands of big institutions like banks, business owners, governments. Some of you probably remember the 2008 crash and the world was falling apart because the banks had overextended, they'd made bad loans, they'd made bad investments. And suddenly, because we were all involved in this kind of economy, everybody was worried about whether they could keep their jobs, right? So they have a lot of power, business owners, of course. And you need a centralized, strong government to have this type of economy. Because to make it thrive, you've got to have roads, bridges. You've got to have all sorts of infrastructure in place. You have to have you know, a lot of things that only the government can supply. Okay. All right, how am I doing on time? All right, well okay. done. So uh, as far as why it makes us more independent for Jefferson, a manufacturing economy meant that people were dependent on business for precarious jobs. A commercial economy splits families and fragments communities. That's something that we don't often think of, but when you think about it, it's very true. When people get out of college today, what do they do? They go someplace else. They don't stay in their hometown. They go wherever there is a job. And once they have a family, sometimes in the middle of raising their children, they move again. And their children are uprooted from their friends and their neighborhood. You won't go into a neighborhood now. I've been in my neighborhood for, I don't know, 10, 15 years at least. I don't know most of the people in my neighborhood. Um, but the, the, the society changes because of that. Um, most importantly, a commercial economy creates a majority that cannot feed itself and supply its own needs and stops thinking in terms of liberty first, um, and therefore is less free and more vulnerable to tyranny, he said. Okay, good. All right, now as far as morality, that's where things get even more, you know, controversial because he thought that the agricultural way of life produced a more ethical or moral citizen. Right? We've already kind of touched on that, but this elaborates. He says, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. Characteristically, he forgot Jewish people are the chosen people of God. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't care for the Old Testament. <laughs> if ever he had chosen a people, a chosen people whose hearts he had made, has made his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue, 
It is the focus in which he keeps alive that sacred fire which otherwise might escape from the face of the earth. Corruption of morals in the mass of cultivators is a phenomenon of which no age or nation has furnished an example. Okay. So literally, uh, he's saying farmers can't be corrupted in their morals, at least not to the same extent. Go ahead. All right, so again, why does an agricultural economy promote more morality? Simpler, quiet life gives more time for thought, deliberation, and community. You're more likely to stay put and develop community. Making money from money. A lot of people like Jefferson thought this was just evil. They called it speculation, uh, and it seemed almost like economic voodoo to them. But basically, by investing and making money from money in the marketplace, you detach yourself from the work involved in making products, the, the actual product itself, and of course the people involved in it. Now, when I invest in Coca-Cola, I am investing in a company that has businesses all over the world, distribution centers, all. I have no idea what's going on in those. Okay? I'm just looking at, is it, making me, uh, inter is it making me a good dividend? So dependency creates a dependency on the economy creates a follower mentality. He said that uh, goes with what is fashionable, whether it pr promotes virtue or not. You know the lemming sort of conformism type of thing. Tocqueville noticed as well, and it creates a market for vice. Okay, so I'm kind of repeating myself, but I think it's worth repeating. Why does an agrarian way of life uh, promote a more spiritual way of life? Kind of interesting too. It, a commercial economy, he says, instills an idea that greed is good. It's in Adam Smith, you know, the invisible hand. If everybody just pursues their own interest, which is profit, everybody will be better off. A rising tide lifts all boats. Living off the land provides you with that time for contemplation, and you have this direct experience with God's nature. In other words, you get to see God's ability to actually make things, and you cooperate with that. Jefferson believed in God, and he felt that nature provided the most direct link to it. You literally were cooperating with God's creation in, in, in doing agricultural work. Working on the land reminds people also of their proper place in relation to the author of the universe, because there are certain things, like rain, <laughs> that you don't have any control over, right? And so it attunes you to that, that sort of, you are not a god. Okay, good. So running a gut, a, up against this ideal set of standards is high society and the lure of civilization. And I relate that back to Rousseau because Rousseau was very critical of this. This is a great quote. Sophie is not beautiful, but in her company men forget beautiful women, and beautiful women are dissatisfied with themselves. Sophie was a character in one of Rousseau's novels, Emile and Sophie. Go ahead. And in Emile and Sophie, he depicts the decline from rural virtue to, to urban vice. Emile is somebody who's raised in a rural setting by somebody like Rousseau. And he's raised to be this perfect person, wholly independent, you know, learns all these skills, knows how to feed himself, knows how to hunt, knows how to fix things, right? And he's taught also empathy and kindness because Rousseau doesn't think that comes naturally, so he's taught to be good to others. Then when the time is right, he is introduced to the similarly educated Sophie, and of course they fall in love because they're the, the exact copy of each other. But Sophie decides, you know, well, she doesn't decide, she gets pregnant. But the great disappointment, the child dies, and they move to Paris because Sophie is in such a state of grief, she feels like she needs the distraction of the city with all of its entertainments and all of its finer food and finer, you know, basically company um, that will distract her and, re and get them out of this period of grief. But they get there, she's bored, her desires are ramped up with all of the society, all the people that she meets around her. She seeks uh, comfort and uh, sort of diversion in an affair. Of course, Emil finds out about this, and the whole damn thing falls apart. They, he leaves her, 
And he goes off, and the last we know of Emil is he's, you know, he's still quite capable of taking care of himself, but the experiment has been blown because of this desire for um, higher civilization. Okay, go ahead. All right, so any questions so far? Because I've kind of, this is the end point as far as explaining why Jefferson preferred the agricultural way of life. Okay. That story of corruption kind of summarizes it. He really felt that people living in big cities, doing manufacturing jobs, engaging in investing and finance, were just a lot more likely to have corrupt values and not be independent good citizens. Okay. No questions so far? Okay. So I was trying to think of, you know, who in our times is as much like Jefferson's way of thinking as possible. And the book club is studying Wendell Berry right now, and he really does seem like pretty close to the same way of thinking. So this is a way that we can kind of relate to the Jeffersonian ideal. He's a critic of industrial agriculture. And really, uh, you know, looking at his novels, you have to say he's a, cri he's a critic to a certain extent of the urban way of life generally, just like Jefferson. Um, and not only because uh, of the environmental impact of industrial agriculture, but its cultural impact, which he spends more time on, really. Um, and many of you may not know, he wrote a lot of novels, and these novels are rather quaint. I read one of them, um, and I probably will read more, but they're about the small town way of life, rural way of life, where everybody knows each other and everybody kind of pitches in. and and uh, some of the challenges that people like that face. Um, go ahead. Um, some of you probably saw him at the Land Institute recently, right? Um, so Wendell Berry, I, I liken his way of thinking to a certain type of natural law. He develops this idea that if you work with the earth properly, you'll find that there are certain rules built into uh, this production, that in order to do it without a lot of what he calls artificial inputs, right, in order to do it the way it's supposed to be done according to him in an organic way, you have to listen very closely to nature and you have to adjust your surroundings and you have to be rather careful about what you do, right? So um, there is a natural law to farming and you can do it successfully if you listen to what <laughs> the earth is more or less trying to tell you, but if you deviate from that, you're probably, you're, you're probably going to have to do it at the expense of the environment and your long-term um, well-being. Um, human nature also demands attachment to the natural world in order to be complete and to develop real good community. The rural way of life, the agricultural way of life, attaches you to a particular place that you can't, if you're going to do it right, you can't leave for a long time. You're going to be there for years and years and years, right? And so community becomes much more possible and they go together, right? Nature punishes violations of its built-in law. That's natural law in a nutshell. So what we get according to Barry with industrial agriculture is, you know, for instance, runoff into streams that creates algae blooms or kills everything and, you know, all sorts of different environmental impacts from that that we end up paying for in the way of health and so on. All right, so just a few things left here. This is from a novel, Jaber Crow, one of his most famous novels, and it describes this uh, lack of independence he, that he thinks goes along with the city cult, uh, sort of manufacturing way of life. On those weekends, he says, the river is disquieted from morning to night by people resting from their work. So he's describing people going to his river for their weekend vacations. They come rolling in, okay. This resting involves traveling at great speed, first on the road and then on the river. The people are in emergency to relax. They long for the peace and quiet of the great outdoors. Their eyes are hungry for the scenes of nature. They go very fast in their boats. They stir the river like a spoon in a cup of coffee. They play their radios loud enough to hear above the noise of their motors. They look neither left nor right. They don't slow down or maybe even see an old man in a rowboat raising his lines. I watch and I wonder and I think. I think of the old slavery and of the way the economy has now improved upon it. The new slavery has improved upon the old by giving the new slaves the illusion that they are free. 
The economy does not take people's freedom by force, which would be against its principles, for it is very humane. It buys their freedom, pays for it, and then persuades it money back, its money back again with shoddy goods and the promise of freedom. So, go ahead. Um, are we good? Uh, this is from a book, A Continuous Harmony, where he says, what have we forgotten? What we have forgotten is the origin of morality. In fact, in circumstance, we have forgotten that the nature of morality is essentially practical. Moderation and restraint, for example, are necessary, not because of any religious commandment or any creed or code, but because they are among the assurances of good health and a sufficiency of goods. Likewise, discipline is necessary if the necessary work is to be done. Also, if we are no to transport, no to transport, transport transcendence and joy. Lo loyalty, devotion, faith, self-denial are not ethereal virtues, but the concrete terms upon which the possibility of love is kept alive in this, in this world. Morality is neither ethereal nor arbitrary. It is the definition of what is humanly possible, and it is the definition of the penalties for violating human punishment, for violating human possibility. A person who violates human limits is punished or he prepares a punishment for his successors, not necessarily because of any divine or human law, but because he has transgressed the order of things. Alive and adequate morality is an accurate perception of the order of things and of humanity's place in it. By clarifying the human limits, morality tells us what we risk when we forsake the human to behave like false gods or like animals. So very critical of this other way of life and here he's basically saying moral or human beings do have limits and morality is about those limits and when we try to go around those limits we automatically uh, open ourselves up to vice. Okay. Finally this is a statement not from Barry but from a blog by Glenn Arbery from the imaginative conservative who sees a certain type of conservatism in Barry. He says, Barry can be seen as restoring the ground for true democratic participation in ruling and being ruled rather than merely casting a vote periodically as part of an abstract social contract. It is true participation because it is local, historically settled, deeply conversant with what is at stake and well cultured. Denis quotes Barry on the cultural conditions for this kind of democracy, quote, to have a culture, mostly the same people have to live mostly in the same place for a long time. Traditional knowledge is knowledge that has been remembered or recorded, handed down, pondered, corrected, practiced, and refined over a long time. Good political choices do not come from the consumption of sound bites, but from deliberation based on traditional knowledge. And sound bites are what people are susceptible to when they live in a fast-paced and highly materialistic environment. Okay, so that's it. Um, any questions or comments?